Uh, the picture you're looking at here on the screen is a, uh, in a cave and there's some rocks outside with slits in them. And you can see these, this is a spiral pictograph, a petroglyph. And you can see that the, there's a dagger of light going right down through the center of it. The dramatic thing about this particular one, which is at uh, Chaco Canyon in Pajada Butte, is that as the sun moves horizontally, the, the dagger moves ver vertically. It comes down, pierces the circle, and goes on out. Uh, if you wait, uh, uh, let's see, six months, uh, the dagger will have moved all the way over to the outside of these circles. Now, it's not very far, and so while it does come down through the center of it, it probably wasn't used to determine solstice. They knew they would find out by more accurate means what, what solstice was, probably by just simply building uh, structures that would tell them that. But this would be a great ceremonial site because of this feature where the dragger came down through it. This is probably the first real uh, major archaeoastronomy site marking the calendrical times of solstices and equinox. Um, and uh, after that, people were just amazed. Oh, these dumb Indians could do this. And it turns out they weren't so dumb at all. They were quite sophisticated and they really knew what they were doing. And sites have been showing up all over the place. Um, the interesting thing about the uh, Los Alamos area um, is that uh, a lot of this seems to have been centered at Sonkawi because uh, a lot of the uh, our ruins are down in canyons down in the bottom where Sonkawi's up on top and so uh, there's there are other ruins up there too uh, uh, but Sonkawi's a pretty good one uh, and uh, the mesas north and south of Sonkawi uh, uh, are candidates for these kinds of things I'm going to talk about two sites that we found. Um, the first one was a uh, north and, and uh, it had a, a great uh, uh, petroglyph almost three feet in diameter with six concentric circles and a bullseye. And uh, in addition, it had like rays going like the, about the size of the palm of your hand going all the way around, 23 of them. I was talking to somebody one time and she said, you know, that might be an archaeoastronomy site. And I said, well, I don't know, an archaeoastronomy site. Oh, you ought to check. So we climbed up there for winter solstice and looked at the circle to see if there were any shadows and everything. There wasn't very much. We were sort of discouraged. Then we turned around and right at sunset, you can see these two hills. Look at that. The sun is setting perfectly between the two. If you go down to Sankawi itself, the sun would be setting sort of over here. Um, you have to go uh, and, and you walk along the mesa to try to get there, but all of a sudden it falls off and you go down in the canyon where Route 4 is. And so you had to, they had to go somewhere else to get something like this. Um, that really got us interested and we started looking at things. And over two or three years, uh, we discovered that this site marks not only both solstices, the winter solstice and the, and the summer solstice, both the equinoxes and the halfway points between the equinoxes and winter solstice, all in one site. And it's quite an interesting story to try to guess why that would be. Um, this is just a, a rock wall. You can't see it very well, but that's, that, there's a circle there and I'll show that to you. But this is the kind of place where this site was. Very, uh, nothing special about it at all. But there's the circle with the, the concentric circles and the bullseye and these palms, 23 hands going around. There's a little shield man here. There's a shield man over here. You can see his feet. His head isn't so obvious. And there's a little flute player over here, which uh, you can see his feathers here and he's playing a flute. Uh, so there's a lot there. Uh, so what was going on there? Uh, for summer solstice, uh, another funny thing, uh, my daughter's boyfriend at the time was an artist and he was visiting, he had a thing to do, I was at work. Um, and he said, what should I do? And I said, well, why don't you climb up to the marker and see if anything happens? 
And I came home and I said to him, well, did anything happen? Oh, oh yeah, the, the dagger went right down through the middle of it. He was very nonchalant about it. I guess he thought these things happened all the time. I said, what? What are you talking about? Uh, and so this is the solstice, summer solstice. You can see this little flute player. See his hand here and his face and everything right in there. Um, and I want you to pay attention to this rock too. We'll be talking a lot about this rock. Um, but you can see that, my gosh, here we are about 9 a.m. Good look at the flute player there. Um, right in the middle on summer solstice, right in the middle. And then on, on down through. And so what we think happened was the uh, people at Sanko, we knew they had to go up on the next mesa to see uh, where the sun set between those two peaks. And so uh, they walked up and down the mesa and looked for other things. And they probably found this shadow. And so they knew what to do. Uh, the shadow would you know, go in this wall uh, during the year and especially at solstice. And then they probably put this thing in there to mark where it was. Having done that, they kept, they weren't done, they kept doing other things. Um, if you look at this shield man over here, a little bit of a head over here, but you can see his feet. Uh, that shield man now gets used to help mark some things also. Uh, I really should go on. If you look at Bill Jack Rogers, he's taking a picture of that. You see he's leaning up against this rock. This rock is a wall and then it comes across this way, it makes a little L. And uh, uh, that L makes a shadow like this. Here's the shield man. And this is on uh, at equinox, spring and fall equinox. It goes right down, but it doesn't go quite through the shadow. It's as if some of the rock got worn off or broken off. If you just put a little bit more of a rock on it, it would work. But nevertheless, it's quite clear that they put this shield man over here because they knew this little angle of light. Uh, before we had an angle of shadow, this time it's an angle of light, would go down through here at equinox. So now we have the equinoxes and we have the season, uh, the, the, the uh, solstices. Uh, you'll notice that this rock isn't touching the other rock there. There's a gap in there. So while this little L here will do the equinoxes, this gap now plays a, a, a game. Um, if you look through the gap, there's the sun. And this uh, is to measure and mark the time halfway between the solstices and the, the winter solstice and the equinox. Jumping ahead, we have not found anything that marks uh, the, the halfway mark between the summer solstice and the equinox. But the, the winter solstice and the equinox what, it marks it here. And what happens is the sun sets so that it shines down through this. Now you can see this little rock here. When you look at where it is, it looks like somebody put that rock there. Uh, and so that, that's important. Uh, Here's Tom Kunkel taking a look at it. There's the shadow it makes. Here's our shield man over here. And that's that L that uh, at Equinox would go down through the shield man. But right now, we're just grazing this rock and making a little dagger with that thing there, you see. It turns out that only about three days uh, at the mid uh, period between equinox and solstice, does this dagger go below the rock? And so the rock is marking that within just a few days. And it, as you can see, uh, the, the uh, shadow is really big here, and it's not so big there. And so you can tell, uh, people looking at that could tell which day was the right day. And so here we are, right near Los Alamos, unbeknownst to anybody, is this big dad thing, thing here, which marks uh, summer solstice, the double peak, which mark where the sun sets right between it, which marks winter solstice, the L shape here, because um, at, at equinox, this, the sun doesn't shine through this gap, it just makes an L that goes down through this little shield man. 
And then finally this. Um, so now that I've stopped to, before I'm going to go to, to part two, which I think is an even more astonishing calendrical site than the one we've seen. But that one we've seen, I think, is as good as any site I've heard of in the Southwest. Uh, again, the, uh, the width of the sun is such that that uh, dagger, that, that uh, angle of shadow going down through the bullseye, you can't tell the difference for a few days. It's, it's only good to about a week. But still, uh, you people could count the days and pick the one in the middle. And, and get it. But also, this might have been a great place to go for ceremonials uh, uh, rather than for actually telling dates and everything else. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's pretty good for doing the dates. Uh, so at this point, I think I'm going to stop and see if there are any questions that Siobhan wants to pass on to me. Hi, Chick. Yeah, we do have a question. Um, is it known when these petroglyphs were created? Well, uh, we know when Sankawi was inhabited, and there's, there aren't any particular ruins north of Sankawi. This one's just across the canyon from Sankawi, and so we would guess that these things were made by the people who were living in Sankawi. 1300, 1400, something like that. Thank you. Um, and have you published this data anywhere? Uh, no, we really haven't done that. Uh, if you want to write something like this up, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. And I, you know, aside from being lazy, uh, we, we may have written little articles about it, but nothing very big. I, I haven't tried to put it in an archaeoastronomy thing or what have you. I would, however, like to talk to some of the people around here who are good at archaeoastronomy things and show them where those are especially if there's somebody from Bandelier National Monument. Okay, that is, those are the questions we have. And I would like to remind you all, that if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. And you'll find the chat in that sort of menu of icons at the bottom or top of your screen. You may have to move your mouse around to find it. And it may be under the more section, but you should see a little button or a little option that says chat and go ahead and ask those questions there. Thanks. Go ahead, Chick. Okay, uh, some of you will recognize that we are at Sankawi here, and this particular layer of rock from about here up to here has lots of holes in it and look uh, around the side, and they many of them look very, very much to the south. You can imagine people using that because they would get solar heating in the winter. The sun would be low and shining right in and warming up their places. Uh, but we came upon one uh, one time that looked particularly interesting. This thing is just a big hole, but here is a quite a nice cave. And uh, it turns out that these, uh, I'll jump ahead, the, this cave and this thing up here are connected by a very small hole and we're gonna talk a lot about that hole. If you go inside the cave, you start to see that this cave is ornamented a lot more than any of the other ones there. Here's a guy with a headdress, um, here's a plumed serpent. There's the guy with the headdress over there. There are special holes, like as if they held uh, wood uh, structures or something, all around the inside of it. And I don't know any other cave aid that, that does that so much, as if they would hang things on it or do things with it. And then there's a very plain, smooth uh, wall down below here, and that'll be important. So having looked at all this, we thought that was sort of interesting. And we noticed the smoke hole that went out to, you know, you would think that that's what it was for, excepting for one thing. Here's the smoke hole. What is that? Now that's pretty, you know, we see it as just a little notch, but it's pretty long because it has to go through all the rock. Um, and what I found out was if I got down where I'm looking right now, and looked up there, I could see the tiniest bit of blue sky, just a little bit of blue sky, uh, by looking through that notch. If you just look through the smoke hole, it, it just got occluded by the, the roof of the, the cave aid above it. Uh, but you could see just the tiniest little bit. And that got me interested because if you shine anything 
through that little tiny notch, it's going to be a pinhole camera and make an image down here where this string would be on that smooth wall. There's Peter O'Rourke helping out. Peter's uh, holding the string right at that hole, and there's the little bit of the notch. And I, we know with the direction because that's what I do. I go down at that bottom and sight and see that small bit of light. Now, what's the chance that the sun might shine in there? And what's the chance it would do it at equinox, at winter, I mean, sol winter solstice? What's the chance it would do that? Looking that direction, I said, there's a real good chance it might be right. So uh, here's what it looks like from the outside. And you can see this notch is quite long, a few inches, and, it, and fairly deep, about two, three inches. There's the shadow of it over there. And you can see this ominous shadow here because as this moves over, it's going to cover this thing up. Uh, you can also see the hole going on down through. So that's the wall down inside. Looking at it here, you can see here's that the, here's the uh, the smoke hole or whatever it is, but this notch. Now you have to ask yourself a very interesting question: Why would anybody make a notch in a smoke hole? And why would anybody make a notch that pointed in a direction that was quite, quite interesting, namely winter solstice? Now, maybe a bunch of astrophysicists with, uh, with Enrico Fermi or somebody were goofing around and they decided to do it, but I don't think so. This looks like a very old structure. It looks like something that the Sankui people probably put there. And they put it there, I think, so that on winter solstice, the sun would shine down in there. And if it did, because it's a pinhole camera, it would make an image of the sun. It wouldn't be a shadow or a dagger. It would be an image of the sun, which would magically light up and then faint, get faint. It wouldn't move. It would magically light up and then get faint. What a remarkable thing. And you say, well, how would these people have known about pinhole cameras? Well, if you've ever been out during a partial solar eclipse, and they're pretty common, partials are, and you stand under a tree, you see about 100 or 200 little crescent suns. And so they would have known what a pinhole camera was. Here we are again. Uh, and this is on winter solstice. And the light uh, is starting to go down this notch. But here comes this shadow, so it's going to be a race between the two. Uh, now you can see that the sunlight is already shining on the notch here. Here's a little bit of the shadow, right? And uh, so we were really getting excited. This looked like it was going to be it. Now there goes the notch, uh, uh, shadow, the, the light from the notch. And all it has to do is get over this part here, and it will shine into the cave. But here comes the shadow from that other wall, trying to cover it up. You'll see a circular feature here, right? And the, this is shining into that. If it gets over the rim of this little crater, it'll shine into the cave and make a picture of the sun. There it is, but here comes the shadow, just about over the edge. Oh no, the shadow got it before it got over the edge. Now, if I were to take a file and file, oh, maybe two or three millimeters off of this crater thing, we would have gotten a pinhole image. And I'm tempted to do it, but then again, you don't want to touch anything in these uh, archaeo areas. Uh, but wouldn't it be interesting to wonder how these people would have gone to all this trouble so that on the winter solstice, the light would shine in here and make that image. So I looked at how the Earth's orbit uh, changes the altitude of the sun and does things over thousands of years. And so maybe that's what happened. Maybe if we uh, put the sun where it really would have been uh, 600 years ago or something like that, uh, it would have made it over that little hole. And just for a moment, the sun would have lit up. And, but it doesn't do it now. And so. Uh, I wonder if there'd be a way to get somebody to say, yeah, you can just take a file and knock some of that rock off and see what happens. But I'm not going to take that uh, on myself without permission from the Park Service. There it is, the sun, the shadow of the thing has gone over our notch and the whole show's over. But there's one more thing. Outside, 
there's a big hole in the rock. Here's the cave you go into, and this one up here is where the shadows are, where, where that hole comes out. Uh, this hole, if you put a ski pole in there, it points right at, you'll notice that there's no shadow of this pole on the rock. That means that the sun is coming right down this into that hole. You can see it lighting up the hole. And so they could have used this as sort of a coarse thing for knowing about what day and about what time to come and observe this kind of thing. Having said that, if this is really true, it's easily the most sophisticated calendrical marker, uh, maybe anywhere, to actually have a pinhole camera that would make an image of the sun, but only uh, on the uh, appointed day. How accurate it would be, how many days on either side, you, we would have to try to figure that out also. But as you can see, it was done so closely so that it doesn't work anymore. So it might have done it only on one day. And so it would have been an extremely precise measurement for all the people living down there. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, Los Alamos area, the Pajarito Plateau, had some pretty smart people and some pretty artistic people. And I always love it when science and art get together to make something very beautiful. And uh, uh, apparently that's uh, the people at Sanco y Pueblo did that uh, at least twice, if not more. Thanks very much. Okay, guys. Um, so if you have other questions for Chick, uh, please put them into the um, chat feature there. Um, I have a couple questions, Chick. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to turn your video back on so people can see you as you answer the questions. Okay. Um, so one question we had, you mentioned, and it, I don't know if it's this photo or not, but you said that um, at some of the Sangui sites, there were, um, there were some circles with 23 lines around them. Oh, this is good. This is, uh, th these are the circles. And if you want to say the, the high thing, one, two, three, four, five circles, and then a bullseye. And these are the, they're not lines. They're like rays of the sun. They're palm sized. That's how big they are. And there's 23 of them that go all the way around. I don't know if we want to associate any uh, significance with 23. It is a prime number, but uh, it may have just been that's the way it turned out as they made these little, these solar rays. I've never seen, we have over at Sanka where you can find some concentric circles over there and some of them actually do seem to mark something about the, the solstices, but I've never seen one with the, if you want to call it the, the rays sticking off of it, nor one nearly this big. This is a pretty big one. How, how big is that across again? Can you say again? Oh, um, let's see. Uh, uh, let me see. I want to go forward. There's Bill Jack, and there's the uh, the thing. So now you can see how Let's big. See. It We're is. Not, we don't quite see it yet. There we go. Okay. Okay. So it's maybe like a, a meter across or so. A little less, but about that size. Yes, it's pretty big. Okay. Great. And very okay. carefully done. Very nice concentric circles. Okay. Um, one of our uh, viewers, Kirk, um, says there are petroglyphs in Tucson with 23 rays around the circular image as well. Oh my goodness! What the heck is 23? <laughs> so yeah, if anyone else has any insight about that, why there might be 23 uh, markers around the circle, um, let us know. Um, let's see. Uh, we have another question about those marks around the um, around the circles. It's from Steve Becker, and he's wondering why some sun symbols have like um, some symbols are like concentric circles, and others are spirals. I've often wondered about that too, uh, especially over in Sankawi, There are several that are spirals; they're not concentric. I think the one at Fajara Butte is a spiral also. Uh, I don't know. Uh, concentric circles uh, may be easier, hard, harder to make than, than spirals, but uh, there may be a significant difference between the two. I don't know, at Chaco Canyon, I think they have spirals. 
So you had a photo of the sun between the two hills. Was the sun setting there or rising? It was setting. Okay, sun setting between the two hills. Um, Serelda is wondering about, not about where the location is, but what, what is that place like when you stand at that spot where you can take that photo? What is that place like? I'm not sure what you mean, what is it like? It's about uh, 20 feet down from the top of the Besa, and it's a little bench, and you can walk along the bench quite safely, uh, although nobody can go there anymore because the DOE gave the land back to the Indians, and it's off limits, so you can't go back to that site anymore. I guess we could if we asked permission and got uh, uh, some Pueblo people to allow us to go with them to, to look at it. I did have an interesting thing though. Uh, if I go back to the Bill Jack Rogers picture, you see this rock right here? I was up there one time late on in my studies and I noticed a piece of paper under it. So I picked the rock up and written on the piece of paper was, don't come here anymore. So somebody else knew about this site um, let's see, we have some other questions. Um, let's see, there are some questions about the notches that you showed. Um, so, let's see. Um, Is that in the second, second one? Yeah, it's where you showed the little, the, the notch, the pinhole camera notch. Yeah. Into the cave. Um, and there, um, Galen is wondering, um, the sun going through that notch must have been at a particular time of day as well as a particular date. And he's wondering- I believe it was around 10 in the morning. Okay, 10 a.m. Okay, and he's wondering if you tried other nearby dates, like the next day or, you know, a week later or earlier. I did not. Um, and- um, It would be, it'd be worth it to- to get a uh, team of people who would agree to go through the snow and everything to get out there several days in a row and watch what happens and document it. I'd, I'd be willing to help uh, out with an effort like that. Okay, great. Um, and there's another um, audience member who's wondering, other holes have been found that have a notch similar to this one. I've never seen a hole in any one of these cave aids that had a notch in it. Okay. That doesn't if, mean there aren't any, I just haven't seen. Okay, if any other audience members have seen such things, let us know about that too in the chat. Um, here's another question about the, um, about the pinhole camera idea. Um, this is from Susan. Are there petroglyphs in the cave showing possible eclipses, sun with the sunspots to indicate the use of a pinhole camera? Yeah, that's a very good question, and uh, the answer is there's nothing that I saw that looked astronomical in there. Um, it was uh, it was just that there was all these things. Now, of course, I guess a person who really is good at uh, deciphering all this might find something, but I didn't find something. But the other existence of all these holes is if they were, you know, holding, you could stick a log out through them and put something on it. I don't know. There were a lot of these holes in that cave. And I, when you go in cave eights, I don't think, you don't see many holes like that. You see a smoke hole or something, but that's about all. So this is, this cave was thought of as something very different from the other ones. It turns out that if you walk just around the corner here on that lower bench, you come upon a parrot that is about three feet high. It's, it's a beautiful uh, example of the petroglyphs and one that uh, I've never seen anywhere else either. And so it just seems like this whole area was sort of sacred to these people. Okay, um, let's see another, we have quite a few comments about the 23, um, the 23 rays around the sun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Arabelle says there's a petroglyph site northeast of Holbrook, uh, Arizona that has a four foot diameter sun with 23 human feet surrounding it. 23, well, that's what the, that's the number of these guys. Yeah, so let's see. Um, let's see, we have, some, we have some suggestions about the 23. Um, one person says 23 full moons and new moons in a year. Is that possible? Oh, that's interesting. 
Yeah. Exactly. Person, this, this could then be like knots in a rope. You could sort of count your way around. Wow. Another person says there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in our cell genomes. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm sure they do about that. <laughs> um, so lots of ideas. Um, okay, let's see. Um, somebody else says that Earth's axial tilt is about 23 degrees. Um, so there's lots of, lots of suggestions, ideas about the 23, but it is interesting that it does seem to be a pattern. Um, let's see. Um, okay, there are a couple of What was the one about the moon? 23 lunar 23. what? New moons and full moons? Does that seem like it would make sense? Well, yeah, th there's roughly, uh, it takes about, what, uh, 29 days or so for the moon to go around. So there's, there's it's not an integral number of, of moons in a year, uh, but they're roughly 12 or so. So 23, if you count new and new and full, um, you get 23. Uh. Okay. Um, let's see. And somebody... Uh... Somebody says that they've recently observed some very large concentric circles just off State Route 4, south of St. Louis, um, and is wondering if you've done any research in that location. Oh, they're probably trespassing on Indian land. Or maybe, I think they, it seems like they saw them from the road. There is one site there that you can see some markers from the road. I've looked at that with binoculars and that, and it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, it would be great if we could talk to the Pueblo people and get a study of that site. But the trouble is those all face, face, well, I'm not sure which direction they face. I don't think they face south, though. But they may face enough south that you could get shadows and stuff, so it would be worth looking at that. Okay. Um, let's see. And then we had a couple of, um, a couple of, comments about, um, you know, you mentioned that the, um, it didn't line up exactly, the pinhole camera didn't line up exactly on the day and time that you looked, and um, some people are wondering about um, precession, um, how that shifts the location of the sun. Um, and well, what you're talking about is uh, not so much precession, but uh, the tip of the uh, Earth's axis goes from about, I forget the numbers, 25 degrees to 21 degrees or something like that. And it takes it about 10,000 years to make the, uh, that gap. So now let's say, how many degrees, we're at 23 and a half degrees, how many degrees would the sun be different 700 years ago from now? And of course, it's, it's not a full degree, but uh, it might be enough. Uh, I wanted to, what I wanted to do is to get somebody who is real good at three-dimensional astronomy to look at this site and, and figure out all those angles and things, uh, which I wasn't able to do. Okay. It looks like there might be enough of the, uh, the tilt to get the sun just a little higher or a little lower so that it would uh, uh, have worked back then and doesn't work anymore. Or as Galen mentioned, maybe on a slightly different day and time. Um, it, yeah, so that one, it seems like worthwhile to look into. So maybe you can get a, a group together who will, who will work on this project. Um, well, uh, you could maybe uh, display my email or something and people, we could, maybe we could get a pickup team and have a go at it. All right, I, I might do that at the end I, because I don't have time to put your email in right now because I'm looking at everybody's questions, but maybe I'll do that at the end if you don't object. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay. Yeah, so it sounds like there are some people who are quite curious about this effect and how, how the passage of six or 700 years would have changed um, the alignment of these things. So it sounds like you might have a little group that will go with you. Not um, to mention the spreading of the Rio Grande River. Oh, that's true. So actually, our tectonic setting has changed a little bit in that time. Um, so that may be an issue as well. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, have you had the chance, with permission, uh, to look for astronomical signs at Shirage? Uh, I've never tried to do that. Um, uh, the Sergei uh, uh, wall is quite interesting, 
And so, yes, we could, uh, it'd be interesting to sort of put together a list, a, a shopping list or a wish list of places we'd like to check out. Uh, and Sergey would be a good one. Okay. And um, someone was wondering if you ever lead any walks to these type of sites. Uh, well, of course, we can't go to this site that's on the screen now anymore without Indian permission. Well, we might be able to get permission. It's, uh, there's, there's two ways to get to it. One is you climb straight up the, the face uh, in, the, in the dirt and gravel and stuff. And there's, there, it was really funny that when I got up to the top of that, there was about an eight foot section that was too vertical to climb. And lo and behold, uh, there were footsteps carved in the rock so you could walk right up. So another indication that people uh, would take the shortcut to get up. The other way to get up there is to go around to the side of the mesa and walk all uh, uh, from, from the end of it and then walk all the way down and, and come back into it that way, which was the way we originally did it. So I, you know, uh, again, supposing you ask the, uh, is it Santa Clara or San Alfonso land? I'm not sure, but supposing you ask them uh, if they know about the site, if they do, they won't let you go. They'll be very secretive, but if they don't know about it. They might want to know about it, and uh, maybe we can get permission to have some people go. Certainly, uh, you, you don't have to go any, you know, you can be above the site uh, to watch the winter solstice uh, thing, and uh, I've done that with informal groups years ago. We would walk and just stand above the site and watch the sun go down between the peaks. I did go to Sankawi and, uh, and uh, try to measure, see if it would go down between the peaks at any particular time. It won't. You have to go over to this place. It's a little farther west, I think. Okay. Um, let's see. So there's somebody who um, has a um, suggestion that the, so we talked about the, the cave notch there, the um, pinhole yeah. camera cave notch. And they were almost wondering if it could be like a fertility symbol, like like a phallic symbol or something. The light penetrates the rock circle. What do you think about oh, that? The mind rushes on, you know, who knows? Once you make a ceremonial site, there's a, there could be fertility. Yeah, there could be a lot of those things. Okay, let's see. We have quite a few other questions. Um, and I guess this, let's see. Aha, uh, uh -huh. Rick says that there are musical rock tables in the Sankawi area. And did you try tapping on any of the rocks in the cave with the notch? No, I didn't try anything like that. Didn't, Maybe that's nothing something looked that's like that kind of a rock, but then uh, you, until you try, you never know. Yep, maybe Rick, you'll have to show us that at some point. Um, let's see. Uh, and Paul is wondering if there are pictographs as well as petroglyphs in the cave, in the cave eggs. Um, I saw no pictographs. Okay. Um, no, somebody who really knows how to look for them, a, a really good uh, pictograph person might find something, but everything we see are petroglyphs. Although we know that there were pictographs. Okay. Um, some people are wondering about uh, not just uh, things that line up with the sun, but if there are any petroglyphs that line up with the moon or constellations. Well, uh, when they studied the uh, site at Fajada Butte in Chaco Canyon, where that dagger was, they were able to get some alignments uh, with the moon. Uh, if you drive from uh, Ponderosa uh, toward uh, Durango, uh, you, go, you can look up on the hill, there's a place called Chimney Rock, and it has a pair of rocks. Uh, and they, and it, unbelievably, spent an enormous amount of energy carrying all these rocks up to make buildings up on that place, far from water and everything else. But it turns out that, the, uh, you know, the moon uh, is tipped about seven degrees uh, to our ecliptic. So it can actually get farther north than the sun gets in, in the winter than the sun gets in the summer. 
uh, and this particular, and you have to know that if you're trying to work out uh, when eclipses are going to be. And this particular side of Chimney Rock, the moon sets right between the two rocks, only when it's farthest north in its orbit. And so uh, they uh, they did pay attention to the moon also, uh, and uh, but the moon is irregular enough that to, to try to do anything with the calendar with the moon doesn't work. The thing to do with the moon is to try to figure out when the eclipses are going to be. Okay, and what about um, what about the stars or the constellations? Are there any um, any any star maps or anything, or anything lined up with any of the stars that you know of? I know of nothing like that. Certainly, they wouldn't cast any shadows, but still, there might be some place you could stand, and at a certain time of year would be the only time you would see a particular star. Uh, I mean, the way to really get uh, uh, a solstice is to find a place where there's a mesa about a mile away with a real sharp vertical wall and then uh, keep walking around as the sun goes farther and farther south and uh, pick the time when the sun just sets behind the mesa so that you can't see the sunlight. The reason that that would be extremely accurate is that you, you know, if you just saw the tiniest bit of sun peeking over, the sun is about a half a degree. So you would have a, a one or two arc minute accuracy for exactly when the solstice was. And that's probably, and then you'd mark where to stand every year. And that's probably how they originally did it. Then they did things like uh, they've done at some of the ruins in Colorado, not Mesa Verde, but some other ruins. Uh, they're on mesa tops. They, they let the sunlight come in through an angled hole in the wall uh, and only on the winter, summer solstice, for instance, does it shine past the door jam into the next room. The rest of the time it just shines in the, the first room, but it's called the adjacent door jam thing. People have done that different places. So they uh, knew how to do all this and they could get it very accurately. But when you have something like what we're looking at on the screen now, that's, that's art and, and maybe religion, that's uh, ceremonial and uh, a good deal more fun than just watching the sun just set behind a rock. Okay. Um, there's somebody else who asks if um, the concentric design has a meaning, has to do with underground water at the site. Is that something that you've heard? Well, you're so far up on the Mesa top, there's no water anywhere. Okay, so you'd have to go down into the canyon to find the water. Or to um, a ravine or to something like that, but this is, there's, there's no obvious way for water to stay around in this particular area. It's pretty vertical. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to see. I'm trying to keep up. I might have missed a few questions, um, but I'm trying to make some sense of it. There was somebody who um, made a comment that back in the early 90s, a scientist at LAMO did an LDRD project on solstice markers. Um, are you aware of that report in 1991 to 94 or so? And it wasn't her primary field of study. Um, but I'd like to see that study. Okay, um, and Paula, if you know the name of that author, um, that would be interesting to, to know. I was about. trying to remember when Anna Sophia was the one who really publicized it. She came to the lab and gave a talk about it. And uh, I was at the Institute of Geophysics then, and we were the hosts for her. So we got to sit around the table and talk to her a whole lot and see a lot of other things. She was very, uh, very, uh, how should I say, uh, protective uh, of all the stuff they did. And, and uh, she was very in awe of the Indians and she, the natives, and she wanted you to be in awe of the Native Americans too. And so anybody suggested, that, I remember that she gave a talk down in Santa Fe and one of the rangers suggested that maybe these people weren't sophisticated enough to do that. And boy, she got the whole audience mad at them. <laughs> so uh, that would have been in the early nineties and I wonder if that might have synchronized or, or been the thing that initiated this uh, work, but I don't, I'm not familiar with it. I'd love to see it if it's written up. 
Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, Paula, if you're still there and if you know, um, if you have any more information about that report, um, Chick would be interested in hearing about it. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, Okay, so it sounds like we still have a lot of interest in um, in this little this pinhole camera and the notch and timing it exactly. And so it sounds like um, there's there would be people who would be interested in investigating that more with you. Chick, do you want me to uh, post your uh, email address in the comments? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Maybe we'll. Okay. You know, there's a little bit of laziness here. We did that, you know, and and uh, it's a lot of work to go out there on a cold winter day and everything, and so. If, uh, if a bunch of people wanted to do it, then suddenly you'd, everybody would enjoy doing it. I'd, I'd love to do that. Okay, so I've posted your email, uh, I've posted Chick's email address in the comments, and if you're interested in following up with him about that, go ahead. Um, Laura is even wondering if, if there might have been something placed in that notch that would have lit up. Uh, if you put anything in the notch, it would cause the, the you might want to do that and there may be some reason to do it, but then it wouldn't be to make a pinhole camera because anything in the notch would keep the sun from shining in at all. Right. Or something I mean, when like you're down there. If you, when you're down there, if you try to look out and see the sky through this hole, you can't. You can only see it through a little tiny piece of this notch. Where, you know, okay. where, where I was looking here. See, I'm looking at, at it and you can only see it in, in that that notch. So if you put anything in a notch, you, you would, it might be something, but it wouldn't be uh, that you were doing it for, uh, for solstice. Okay, great. Um, is there any evidence of a geocentric or heliocentric view of our solar system in any of these sites? Uh, no, I didn't see anything like that. I don't think they would know what that was anyway. I don't think they knew what the planets were or where they were or what they were doing. Okay. Um, all right. If anyone has any other questions or if there are, let me see, if there are any of you who are on, um, on your phone and can't access the chat, this would be a good time to, um, I'm going to unmute you and just see if you have any questions. Um, so if you are tuning in. By, by the way, I was just noticing, you can see there's a serpent here and some stuff here that all the other pictures were behind us uh, of, of things. So the, these things go all the way around. There's another one of those holes. Uh, but uh, uh, these, uh, this wall is, is behind us. The, the, if you look at this wall, you have your back to where the notch is. And yet, uh, I guess you could see quite clearly that there's stuff over here too. I mean, this is a, this cave is different from a lot of the other caves. It, something was going on here. It is 8 p.m. So I know that you all have other things to do on your Friday night. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Chick, thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences with us. Um, well, it is quite a nice story and I'm, I'm really happy to share it with other people. Great, and the summer solstice is coming up on June 20th. Yeah, and that dagger, that shadow will be going right down through the circles, but unless we got permission or unless we wanted to sneak up there, uh, mm -hmm. there'll be nobody looking at it. I wondered if uh, we could stand at the Y and look up with binoculars and see it. Maybe I'll try that. Yeah, we can't Good recommend sneaking into private land to look at things like that, but um, maybe there will be something that you yourself can observe from your own home or wherever you are um, during the solstice. Or you could create something, I guess, in your home. Um, so, um, all right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, it was great to see so many people um, and so much interest in this topic. And uh, again, thank you very much, Chick, and we will, um, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Well, I'd like to, before we go, I'd like to advertise that Peak, uh, uh, the, the staff at Peak, you'd think they would be just sitting doing nothing because of the virus. No, they're working more like beavers than anything. And uh, Rick and a bunch of the astronomers, every, fr every Friday at 7, there's some really neat talks. And, and it'll be uh, for a while, a sit at home and look at your screen talk, but uh, let's, uh, 
let me advertise that uh, next Friday and the Friday after that, it's fascinating stuff. Yep, we've got talks, astronomy talks pretty much every Friday night. We have other talks on Tuesday nights and we've started our summer family evenings series uh, with family friendly content every Wednesday night. So there is quite a bit going on and you can see all of that at our website, peaknature.org. So check it out and see um, if there's something else that you might wanna participate in. All right, so thank you guys so much and have a great evening. Bye.